that to me speaks volumes about your values, that you do value equity, that any kind of systematic or unsystematic bias will be discovered and people will be held accountable. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. On today's episode, I'm so pleased to bring you Dr. Elena Fuentes Affleck. Dr. Fuentes Affleck is a professor and the vice chair of pediatrics and the chief of pediatrics at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And she's also the vice dean for academic affairs in the School of Medicine. Thank you so much for carving time out of your super, super busy schedule. I was just looking at your your CV and the body of your work. I'm always amazed and awed by guests on the podcast, especially a leader like you. But then it's no wonder to me that the busiest people always find time to do these kinds of things. And I think it says something about your ability to multitask and to prioritize things. So I I do want to thank you so much for being on our podcast. And I know you have a very interesting topic that no one in the almost I guess, we're, gosh, we're going on year three, has talked about. So uh, why don't you just lay it out there, and we're going to get right into this juicy topic. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kim. The topic I want to share with everyone is the faculty salary equity review process that we have utilized at the University of California, San Francisco. Several years ago, we were charged by the university president to undertake a faculty salary equity review study. The purpose was to understand within our university, we have 10 sites within our university, UCSF is one, of whether there is any evidence of a systematic difference in compensation between women and men and between underrepresented and non-underrepresented faculty. So that's the order that we got from the president. When the order came down, it was assigned to each campus. At UCSF, we are all health sciences, so we're a little different than some other universities. But everyone was charged with undertaking a faculty salary equity review study. And we anticipated from the beginning that this would be an annual or biannual process. So the first thing we did was organize ourselves because it sounds like a very straightforward topic, and at some level it is. But for any of you who think about how compensation is structured, you can start to see that there are a lot of nuances, even to decide whether or not there's evidence of a gender-based or ethnicity-based difference. So we created an oversight committee that would be responsible for preparing the campus's report and for allocating responsibility to each school. And our effort was overseen by our vice provost for academic affairs. We had representation from all the schools. We had representation from our academic senate. We worked in close collaboration with our chancellor's office and with our campus council office. But we realized that we needed to define the parameters that we were going to study. We needed to identify the data sources, which we would base our analysis, and how we would disseminate the information. So we focused on full-time faculty. And again, that sounds like a very straightforward issue. What we ended up deciding was to define full-time. Our population is those faculty who are appointed at 75 to 100 percent effort. And for everyone in the 75 to 99 percent effort category, we annualized their compensation up to a 100 percent effort. We realized from the outset that there are some differences in faculty members who work less than full-time as compared to full-time faculty. So we decided to circumscribe the population according to that method. And then we pulled data from our payroll system. We decided to pull the data using September 1st as our timeline because although we are on a July to June calendar, we all know that for salary changes that occur on July 1st, it takes a little bit of time for all of those changes to be recorded in the data system. So we pulled the data on September 1st. We linked that with data, identifying data, demographic data from a different system to create our data set. And we began by running a campus level or university level analysis, whether there was any evidence of gender or ethnicity based differences in compensation. Then we stratified by school and ran that. 
and then we delivered the data to each school. I also want to say that we focused on fixed compensation. Every school has slight nuances in terms of their terminology, but for this purpose, we removed any incentives earned through clinical incentives, and we removed leadership stipends. We were really focused on the fixed elements of the compensation. Well, just to amplify what you said in being very careful and planful at the beginning of this, because there are so many nuances, we, you know, we talked to fa- faculty or when I talk to friends out in other industries and they kind of roll their eyes like, yeah, what, what's a big deal? Just pull the data, run it. And it's, and it's like you said, it's not so straightforward. There are so many subtleties, not only at Hopkins, we call it part A salary, part B, part C, but then you have, we stratify by taking out the higher paid departments. We put them out, take them out for some of the analyses like orthopedics. We run different analyses by PhDs, MDs, the basic, the clinical departments by basic science departments. So we run our data all different ways to Sunday. And that's when you start seeing, when you present the data, how you see all the, oh my gosh, it's, it's not that easy. And then you talk about anonymity and confidentiality when you have a department or a division that has two faculty who are underrepresented in medicine. You, you don't want to be careful about publicly disclosing those salary because it's going to be clear who, who you're talking about. So there's just so, it's so complex. So I like how you set this up and, and saying you need to bring people together, planful. I didn't even think about starting those and you know, pulling the data till September. So that's a new one to me. But I hope people listening to this understand that you don't just grab a, a biostatistician and just start doing this. You have to, like any scientific endeavor, be very careful and cautious and planning this. So thank you for setting that, that up for us. Absolutely. It, again, it sounds simple, but once you get into some nuances and you have to decide, well, what do you do with the higher compensated specialties, et cetera. So what we do is a series of analysis at a central level. We run the all schools together. We run one set of analyses. Then we run for each school. And then we give the data to each school. So when I received the data for the School of Medicine, the first thing that we did was analyze the data for each department. And in addition to gender and race ethnicity in the core analytic model, we also included academic title and we included a variable in terms of PhD or clinician. But that, like everything else about this particular issue, is complicated. For example, someone could be MD-PhD and solely focus on research, be functional equivalent of a PhD. It's really hard for us to capture in a data set a granular assessment of whether the person is a clinician or is a researcher. So some of our data you have to interpret, I won't say with a grain of salt, but understanding that some of the categorizations obscure a lot of nuances that may exist within. And what we have done for, we've done it for five consecutive years. We now, we took a one year pause because of, it's actually an enormous undertaking. And then this year, because of the COVID, we're taking another pause. But we then provide the data to each department. We run it centrally, and then we provide the data to each department, and we basically inform them you do or do not have a gender or ethnicity-based difference in fixed compensation. And if we find a statistically significant difference, then the department has about a month to provide a report back to us as school of medicine leaders and then to the university because our committee has the authority to require correction if it appears that there has been a systematic problem rather than something that could be explained. And so we thought it was important for us to run the data centrally with a core set of values, variables, sorry, that we could apply across departments. And then if they wanted to perform additional analyses, perhaps subspecialty or some other factor, they would have that ability. But we wanted to be applying the same analytic framework across the school, knowing that in a large school like ours, that's complicated and it'll work better for some departments than others, but we thought that a consistent methodology was really important. 
you said values instead of variables. But in my head, right away, I'm like, well, that makes sense though, too. Values works to me because you are, you're giving a message loud and clear. If you're running these data and collecting these data annually, at least, or at least biannually and reporting school wide and department wide and that the committee has been given the the authority and the power to ask for feedback and some remediation plan or some kind of uh, salary equity adjustment plan, that that, to me, speaks volumes about your values, that you do value equity, that any kind of systematic or unsystematic bias will be discovered and people will be held accountable. So I imagine those values are, are very uh, apparent and in, not only explicit, but implicit. And I'm, I'm sure that when you at UCSF hire people, that that's also baked into the system that would hopefully nip that in the bud. Thank you. Yes, equity is one of our core values. And you're right, this is our commitment to this process demonstrates our commitment. So what we have found every year is a three to five percent gender-based difference in fixed compensation in our school. It's not in every department, but we have consistently found that. And when we have then delivered data to the department, we find differences in some and not in others. It has been very rare for us to find a difference on the basis of ethnicity. For the most part, we have documented gender-based differences. And the department, when they apply perhaps some additional analyses, usually incorporating a subspecialty designation, the explanation we often receive in response is that there are fewer women in those sub-areas that are most highly compensated. So that may be true, and it may be reflective of the national experience. It doesn't tell us why women are more likely to be in the lower compensated field, but it is an explanation. We allow, again, departments to provide some additional analyses, but they have to show us the analyses. We we require the analytic results. Over the five years that we have done it, we have had no more than five cases where we have received evidence of a difference that could not be explained. And so in those cases, we get very granular data about hiring date, comparison, faculty members, and we have required that the department make a retroactive correction to the compensation. So we do have that authority, but we have not had to use it very often. So we disseminate a version of the report on our website. Any listener who's interested, if you Google UCSS salary equity, you'll find the public versions of our report. We are definitely committed to transparency, but we don't want to betray anyone's confidentiality. So we do walk that fine line. But we are very committed because we know that compensation is something that faculty members care a lot about and that they tie their contribution to the compensation they receive. So we want it to be fair and equitable, transparent to the extent that it makes sense. But we want to be accountable. And it's been a very Sometimes a little bit uncomfortable process, some of the conversations, but in general, it's been very informative. The faculty get highly engaged in this process, and the leaders also appreciate the attention and the transparency. So we plan to continue this. I look forward to connecting with anyone if you have questions after reading the public version of the report, because it has been a way for us to demonstrate our commitment, but in a very data-driven, values-informed way. I really applaud that accountability and transparency. It, it's um, really refreshing to see. I think that's really great. And you're really modeling leadership. And leadership, like you said, it, it's not always comfortable. It can be uncomfortable. But that uh, typifies good leadership is when you are willing to step into sometimes sticky messes and hold your own and be open and honest. So kudos to you and UCSF for this. This season, we're talking on the Faculty Factory podcast about habits and hacks. 
I was curious, what would you be willing to share to talk to specifically, say, early career faculty members who maybe don't have the position yet to be involved in salary equity surveys or policies, but they are wondering about how this impacts them, their own careers and their own advancement? What advice would you give to any faculty member listening out there about how what latitude they have around salary equity? Right. Well, we know this is a really important aspect of the employment process, and yet we almost treat it as if it's a taboo. So I would encourage everyone to speak to their supervisor. That might be their division chief, it might be their mentor, it might be their department chair, whoever's involved in setting salary to understand how how does money flow within your university, how is your salary determined, what are the points of your compensation that are negotiable or that are based on performance or based on incentives? What are the points of leverage, essentially? And how can the faculty members improve? Not everyone wants more money. Sometimes people want more flexibility. But even so, if you understand how compensation is structured at your university, you'll be better informed to advocate for yourself, ask questions, and it's okay to, to press that person and say, I didn't understand that, or could you tell me again, or where can I read more about this? Because every university is slightly different. You talked about part A, part B, we use X, Y, and Z terminology. So that's where it's fine to ask the basic question and take responsibility to be informed, and then you can just ask, is there a way for me to negotiate for a higher compensation? What would I need to do to get a higher compensation? There's no harm in asking that, but if, if it starts with information about how compensation is set, that's the best way to begin that process. So well said. Curiosity. That's, I, I like how you set that up with the idea about stigma, or it's a kind of a taboo topic. And, and you're right, the more we talk about things and pull back the curtain, the less likely something is to be stigmatized or taboo or something that is whispered about and maybe causing hard feelings. And so I think the way you've set this up is just beautiful. It was very well said. Be curious, ask the questions, be comfortable with hearing no, be comfortable in your discomfort. And that's what, um, that's what we all do as leaders. So that was just so, so great. Uh, Dr. Fuentes Affleck, you are wonderful, folks. Dr. Fuentes Affleck is, again, the Vice Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Medicine at UCSF, pediatrician, epidemiologist. She is a professor and the Vice Chair of Pediatrics there at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And as you heard her tell you, go onto the website, UCSF, and I guess just Google Salary Equity Report. And um, you'll find all that information, and I'm sure she'd love to share with you the methodology, and you could use her to coach you and your system through the same process. Elena, you have been wonderful, so wise. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.